Welcome to this online, but no less communal service of Neshoba Unitarian Universalist Church. I am the Reverend Beth Lefevre, pleased and privileged to be the minister of this congregation, and I'm so very glad that you have joined us this morning. Our opening words are by you, you children, who said, Church is where we pray and sing and talk. Church is where we learn to cooperate with different people. Church is a place to help. Church is a place where no one is a stranger. Church is where we share our ideas, treasure other people and ourselves, and help others. Church is religion. Church is believing. Let us be in church together as we gather this morning in worship. And now Tom Adams, our youth advisor, will light our chalice and recite the words of our covenant. I've been reminded this week that life is filled with both dark and light. The words I'm going to read this morning for our chalice lighting come from Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events about the Baudelaire Orphans. If you know me, you know I love this series. And uh, I love it in part because these words came at a time in my life that was pretty dark and uh, they actually provided light. So this morning, as we think about our own lives, I hope that we will find light and goodness and love. The Baudelaire orphans, of course, had been in the dark many times before they made their way in the dark over the Bray to the far side of the island, where the Arboretum guarded its many, many secrets. There was the darkness of Count Olaf's gloomy house, and the darkness of the movie theater where Uncle Monty had taken them to see a wonderful film called Zombies in the Snow. There were the dark clouds of Hurricane Herman as it roared across Lake Lacrimose, and the darkness of the finite forest as a train had taken the children to work at Lucky Smell's lumber mill. There were the dark nights the children spent at Proof Rock Preparatory School, and the dark climbs up the elevator shaft of 667 Dark Avenue, there was the dark pit they had built high in the Mortmain Mountains, and the dark hatch they had climbed through in order to board the Queequeg, and the dark lobby of the Hotel Denouement, where they thought their dark days might be over. But most of all, the Baudelaire orphans had been in the dark about their own sad history. They did not understand how injustice and treachery could prosper, even this far from their home, on an island in the middle of a vast sea and that happiness and innocence could always be so far out of reach. The Baudelaire's were in the dark about the mystery of their own lives, which is why it was such a profound shock to think at last that these mysteries might be solved. The Baudelaire orphans blinked in the rising sun and gazed at the expanse of the Arboretum and wondered if they might not be in the dark any longer. Now, if you please would, join me as we recite our affirmation of covenant. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is our sacrament and service is our prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve human need, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other and with God. A long, long time ago, there was a volcano living all alone in the middle of the sea. He sat high above his bay, watching all the couples play and wishing that he had someone too. And from his lava came this song of hope and he sang out loud every day for years and years. I have a dream, I hope it will come true, that you're here with me and I'm here with you. I wish that the earth, sea, and the sky up above will send me someone to lava. Years of singing all alone turned his lava into stone until he was on the brink of extinction. But little did he know that living in the sea below Another volcano was listening to his song, 
every day she heard his tune. Her lava grew and grew because she believed his song was meant for her. Now she was so ready to meet him up above the sea as he sang his song of hope for the last time. I have a dream. I hope it will come true that you're here with me and I'm here with you. I wish that the earth, sea, and the sky up above will send me someone to lava. Rising from the sea below stood a lovely volcano looking all around, but she could not see him. He tried to sing to let her know that she was not there alone. But with no lava, his song was all gone. He filled the sea with his tears, watched his dreams disappear as she remembered what his song meant to her. I have a dream I hope will come true that you're here with me and I'm here with you. I wish that the earth, sea, and the sky up above will send me someone to lava. And oh, they were so happy to finally meet above the sea. All together now, their lava grew and grew. No longer were they alone with Aloha as their new home. And when you go and visit them, this is what they sing. I have a dream. I hope it will come true. That you will grow old with me and I will grow old with you. We thank the earth sea and the sky we think too. I lava you, I lava you, I lava you. These words written by songwriter James Ford Murphy were for the Disney animated short entitled Lava. It's one of my favorites because while it seems like a love story, it's actually a story of interconnectedness. You see, the volcano thought he was all alone, but he really wasn't. There was another volcano that he couldn't see hearing his song. And he longed for connection. And I think that resonates with us today when we're all so far away from loved ones. We might be feeling a little bit isolated and alone but we're really not. Our Unitarian Universalist principles are perfectly in line with this song, particularly our seventh principle that we celebrate the interconnected web of which we are all a part, that what affects you affects another. And this includes not only people, but the land, the sea and the sky. And so this song and this story resonates with me so strongly. As we celebrate, too, Earth Day this weekend, we need to be mindful that what we do to the Earth comes back to us. And what we do to one another comes back to us. Because we're all connected. There is a web that we're all a part of. And if we pull one string it pulls on someone else's string. And so when we think about this, when we think that we are a part of something bigger than ourselves, that's pretty special. It means that we aren't alone. It means that there is connection, even when we can't see it. And also, it means we have a responsibility to each other, to the land, to the sea, and to the sky to take care of one another, to treat it gently, to treat it with respect, to see the beauty in all of those connections, even when it's hard to see. I lava you, I have a dream for you, that you're here with me and I'm here with you. And I thank the 
sea, earth, and sky, that we are all connected. May it always be so. I lava you. Our offering words are by Michael A. Schuler. If you are proud of this church, become its advocate. If you are concerned for its future, share its message. If its values resonate deep within you, give it a measure of your devotion. This church cannot survive without your faith, your confidence, your enthusiasm. Its destiny, the larger hope, rests in your hands. Please give as you are able via the methods listed on the graphic. We are grateful. This morning are from the Christian Scriptures, the New International Version. From 1 Corinthians 9, 9 through 10. For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? And from 1 John 4, 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Here end our readings. Some years ago at a Unitarian Universalist workshop with about 30 people present, I participated in an exercise. We were asked to place ourselves physically on a line in the room which represented a continuum. At one end of the line, those who felt their churches had a very intellectual orientation were to gather. At the other end, those who felt their churches had a more spiritual orientation were to stand, or we could place ourselves anywhere along the continuum between those two extremes. All but one or two of us huddled at the intellectual end of the line no one stood at the spiritual end. We were then asked to place ourselves along the line at a place which would represent where we would like our churches to be in this regard. Though one or two people stayed at the intellectual end, several moved all the way down to the spiritual end, while most of us stood somewhere to the spiritual end of center, which is where I stood. This was several years before I entered seminary where I would explore the place of and kinds of spirituality in our lives in great depth. But it was not before I had figured out what didn't work for me. What didn't work for me was the kind of spirituality I was exposed to rarely, fortunately, but which intrusively found its way into my psyche anyway the kind that spoke of hellfire and damnation and woman's lesser than place in the world, the kind that talked about our sinful natures and God's omniscient and omnipotent nature and his smoldering, brooding anger. That kind of theology shadowed all of my efforts of being a good Christian even in some really good Christian churches that preached love and forgiveness rather than sin and punishment. I believed Christianity was the only way to spiritual expression and tried hard to make it work. 
I think it is a factor of that very trying that I felt such release and relief when I finally let it go after discovering Unitarian Universalism. The abandonment of a theology that simply did not fit made room for a spirituality that did fit. And Unitarian Universalism gave me the nourishment, support, and freedom to develop a spiritual life that works for me. It has done the same for many of us, though the spirituality varies tremendously among us. For some of us, it is the absence of belief that best fits, and we can breathe deeply of the freedom not to believe. We cherish the church, which allows us to share that stance with intelligent, compassionate, and responsible, like-minded people. For others of us, humanism, paganism, Buddhism, Taoism, Islam, Christianity, or blends of many different doctrines best work for us. Such divergent beliefs are embraced and nourished in our tradition. What an extraordinary church this is. What a wonderful coming together we are given every week. What tremendous discussions, disagreements, and delightful dissonance we have. But it is this very personal nature of Unitarian Universalist theology that makes it so difficult to explain to others. I love my church. It's, it's so... Unitarian Universalism is a wonderful denomination. It's just so... This is truly a unique denomination, and ours is a unique church. But when it comes to describing it to people, many of us are at a loss for words. While we want to sing its praises, all that most of us can really do is hum a few bars of the profound and intricate melody and lyrics that are UUism. A common charge leveled against us is you don't believe in anything. I have always believed that the more accurate overgeneralization would be that we believe in everything because of our wide range of diverse individual beliefs. But articulating our theology is tough because we are so much in the most positive sense of the word. We are grand and inclusive and roomy enough to fit many different theological perspectives. I once found an article grappling exactly with this problem, how to explain UUism to others. The author suggested that we tell people that UU is not a what, it is a way. We are not about telling people what to believe. We are about service and we are about process. We are about movement and life and searching and growth and debate. Often it is through such debate that my spirituality takes shape. It is when I give voice to my beliefs that they gain substance. It is when I argue my path that my spiritual journey evolves. I do embrace the spiritual. This is not because I have received any special insight or revelation of the divine. It is simply because I choose to believe. I think that all belief is a choice. Faith is not something that happens to us, something with which we are mystically imbued after some experience that we construe as divine. No matter how fully or certainly we believe, no matter how convincing or powerful our experience, in the end, we believe because we choose to believe. This does not detract from the power of faith. I believe in the power of faith. I think our beliefs shape us as we shape them. I think we tend to attract to us that which we believe and believe in and think about. Still, I think that belief is a choice, and I've made that choice because it works for me. 
Believing in something larger than myself makes me a bigger person with more depth, more compassion, more connection to others. To believe in something larger than what I know of the world enlarges and enhances my perspective and my sensibilities. I am simply less full when I suspend my beliefs. But it is because I have been able to create a spirituality that makes sense to me that I am able to believe and believe deeply. When I discovered our faith tradition and was finally able to let go of my attempts to fit myself into what was for me a constricting Christianity, I suddenly found myself full of a profound and exquisite emptiness. I suddenly found this wonderful open space within me where there was room for something more. And slowly, a convoluted but very real spirituality began to emerge out of my own inner depths. For some time, I worried that it was not profound or authentic enough because I seemed to be creating it myself. But then I thought that that which seems most real to me, even though it is drawn from many different sources, is probably what is the truest because it is personal. And if the spiritual is not to be found in the personal, then just where might it be? Our Carlos Nakai, a Native American of Navajo Ute descent, said in an interview, I come from a culture that is personally defined, with no dogma or cultural dog doctrine. No one Native person anywhere in the world can speak for the whole culture. Each Native person is responsible for developing a personalized state of awareness. I think that that is what I have been able to do in our tradition. I think that that's what many of us have done who have left more traditional churches in search of a better theological fit. And the personal theologies we have created are a delightful blend of spiritual thought, practice, and belief. My personalized state of awareness, as Nakai calls it, tends toward a belief in reincarnation because that makes a certain amount of sense to me. I also believe that God is and that we are all one with God, whom I most often call spirit. I believe that the God consciousness is an energy, a power, a force that enfolds us all whether or not we choose to tune into it. That is what I choose to believe today. And there are several ways I use these beliefs. One is that I try to remind myself to see the old soul in every person. When I am watching or listening or interacting with someone and re remind myself to see the old soul in them, I am filled with a deep reverence for who that person is and has been and all that there is that I cannot begin to know. I don't know if it's true or not. I think it might be, and so choose to believe that it is, resulting in a deeper respect and compassion for that person that I, than I otherwise might ever have. Another way is that I try to carry the flame of the chalice with me after worship. And when I remember to be aware, I try to see the people around me, strangers often, enfolded in the light of spirit represented by our chalice light. When I do this, again, I feel more connected and at one with others, more in awe of the human condition and more universal and likewise, more Unitarian. Is there room for spirituality within Unitarian Universalist theology? Absolutely. And for me, and maybe for some of you, there is more room here than we have found in other religious traditions. The wide experience of our way of being 
allows me to grow the garden of my spirituality without fear of its being over-tended. And those are the words I think I would put to the melody of UU theology. In our tradition, the seeds of spirituality are sown, nurtured, encouraged, and embraced. But the reaping is up to each of us alone. And delightfully, no two gardens are alike. Amen. Let us now move into a time of meditation, reflection, and prayer. Spoken words for this morning's meditation are by 19th century Unitarian minister William Henry Channing. Channing said, to live content with small means, to seek elegance rather than luxury and refinement rather than fashion, to be worthy, not respectable, and wealthy, not rich, to study hard, think quietly, talk gently, act frankly, to listen to stars and birds, to babes and sages with open hearts, to bear all cheerfully, do all bravely, await occasions, hurry never to let the spiritual, unbidden and unconscious grow up through the common. This is to be my symphony. Let us consider these words as we go about our days, as we await our next meeting, until we come together again. Amen, and blessed, blessed be. <clears throat> recap for you the highlights of the board's April 21st meeting. The board met on April 21st for our second and dare we hope last Zoom meeting. From our various remote locations which included living rooms, porches, and someone's car, we Zoomed together. The secretary will prepare the official meeting minutes for approval at the next meeting. But in the meantime, here's an informal recap of that night's business. As usual, before the meeting, the board got written reports from the minister, the finance committee, the treasurer, and our membership coordinator. After discussing those reported activities, we then got verbal reports and verbal supplements to the written reports from our DRE, Sarah, from Reverend Beth, from our treasurer, Wes, and from the connection team. The connection team is headed by Dale. The board 
then return to two items of unfinished business. First, Trish Holt, chair of the Ad Hoc Committee on Professional Development, addressed the board about the task of winding up that committee's work. In January, they presented the board with a draft of the several documents that embodied their work product. And in January, the board members responded with questions, some suggested edits, and some revisions. Um, Trish, at last night's meeting, explained that the committee's next step, a detailed editing and revision of those documents, would be very difficult to manage without an old-fashioned, pre-COVID era face-to-face -face committee meeting. So that committee has paused its work until they can actually sit down together and go over the documents. The second item of unfinished business had to do with updating our membership roles. Each year Neshova updates our roles and we are sort of midway into that chore at the present. Board Secretary Kathy Hickok advised and the board agreed that we should carry through with that effort, especially now since we have so much fresh um, updated information from the connection team's effort to make contact with every Neshoban. We took up several items of new business next. This is the time of year when we are normally completing our annual pledge campaign while the Finance Committee begins to formulate next year's budget. The stewardship team opted this year to delay the pledge campaign due to the pandemic. The Finance Committee has studied a great deal of information including projections and predictions about the likely financial impact that Neshoba and our members may expect in the coming year. So much is unknowable. But in the near term, the board and our congregation as a whole will likely have to decide how to address a possibly significant budget deficit. The next item of new business had to do with the GA. Um, with an entirely virtual online General Assembly coming this summer, the board agreed to be a little more proactive and deliberate as we encourage attendance and offer financial assistance to cover the fixed cost of attendance. The board also agreed to hold another town hall meeting via Zoom uh, on May the 3rd, so watch for more information about how to plug into that. And we agreed to hold the annual congregational meeting on June 14. We so very much hope that the June 14 meeting will be back in our sanctuary. And finally, the board decided to offer this video version of the recap that normally appears in the newsletter. It was the board's view that this video version should be particularly amateurish and unpolished. I think I nailed that. And I nailed it just in time. I have an appointment with my sofa. Man, I miss you folks. Take good care.